You're watching a News 3 special report covering campaign 2014. Hello, everyone. We welcome you to our 2014 election coverage of the Georgia primary. I'm Phil Scoggins. And I'm Teresa Whitaker, first of the mayor's race, where Columbus Mayor Teresa Tomlinson sought to become the first mayor since Bobby Peters to serve two terms in office. Her opponent, Colin Martin, is former vice chair of the governmental affairs for the Greater Columbus Chamber of Commerce. Taking a look at the latest results, which do not include the early voting numbers, Mayor Teresa Tomlinson with 59% of the vote over Colin Martin, her challenger, taking just 41% of the vote. News 3's Jesse Mitchell joins us live now from Mayor Tomlinson's campaign headquarters on Macon Road, where the celebration is underway. Jesse. Phil and Teresa, I have been here all day, and the fans are still here, just like they have been since 7 this morning. As soon as the results came in, they were screaming four more years, dancing the night away with some uh, with a DJ playing music all night. And the crowd just really amped up and positive. And we have the mayor here. She is ready to talk about her campaign. How did this all culminate in this huge night for you. Well, I guess we had two things that nobody else had. One, we had a really strong record of accomplishment we could run on. And the other thing is we had the world's greatest volunteers because these folks have been here since 7 a.m. this morning. <laughs> It's just amazing. And when you have when you have people like that that want a better Columbus and just want good government, it, it's easy to go through sort of the drudgery of the past five months. And, and some of it, you know, got a little ugly, but we kept it positive. We kept it on the facts and on the substance of our record. And I think it paid off in the end, obviously. So we're very proud of the race that we ran. All right, so we know it's been a long, hard road for you. What is the first thing you're going to do in the morning? Well, actually, I'm sleeping in. Uh, my family yeah, my family is here, so we're going to sleep in a little bit and have ourselves a nice breakfast before they get on the road back up to Atlanta, my mom and dad and my sister. So um, I just I thank God for them and for these great volunteers and supporters that we've had from across the city. It's just been amazing. Uh, very, uh, I guess, reinvigorating. Uh, you know, I'm ready to take on another four years with this kind of support. Um, broad support so it's it's really a blessing and I, I'm just very thankful to be mayor of such a great city all right thanks again mayor and congratulations hey, thank you. Thank all you. right <laughs> as you can see the crowd still crazy live here they're about to go home and go to sleep after a long day I am too live at Mayor Tomlinson's headquarters on Macon Road Jesse Mitchell WRBL News 3 on your side all right, thank you so much, Jesse. Now over to Colin Martin's camp, where the mood not quite as light tonight. News 3's David Hurst has been following the challenger all day and joins us now with what Martin had to say. Phil, Teresa, things are wrapping up here at the Colin Martin viewing party. Martin just thanked all of his volunteers in his concession speech. He told all the supporters, all the volunteers, thanks for just their efforts during this campaign season. Everyone is disappointed in the outcome, but proud of their efforts after months of campaigning. Martin did give Teresa Thompson a call earlier. He wasn't able to get a hold of her, but did leave a voicemail saying congratulations. He declined to give a statement to the media, but when we asked him earlier in the day if he lost what he would do, he told us he wasn't sure, but knew mayor title or not, he would continue to serve the Columbus community. Reporting from the Marriott in downtown, David Hurst, WRBL News 3, on your side. All right, thank you, David, for that live report. Moving now to another hot race tonight, the race to see which Republicans will face each other in a runoff to be their party's nominee for the U.S. Senate seat being vacated by Saxby Chambliss. A whopping seven candidates are battling it out in the primary. The Associated Press already has projected that David Perdue is headed for a runoff, but it's too close to call as to whether he will face Congressman Jack Kingston or former, former Secretary of State Karen Handel. Looking at the results, Perdue with 30 percent of the vote, Kingston 27 percent, Handel 21 percent. That's with 69% of the precincts reporting. Now, for the Democrats, four candidates have been scouring the state for votes as well. The front runner, Michelle Nunn, daughter of former U.S. Senator Sam Nunn of Georgia. She has been called as a projected winner by the Associated Press. Nunn secured the spot. Take a look at those numbers. 76% of the vote, uh, followed by Steen Miles, who captured 11%. Todd Robinson of Columbus uh, with 10% of the vote, and that's with 69% of the precincts uh, reporting. Now, local candidate Todd Robinson tells News 3 that his loss is not the end. Maybe their time will come, and maybe people will see that, hey, uh, he was committed, he, uh, he uh, ran the race, he finished the course, he kept his eyes on the prize, and, uh, and whatever adversities came, he, he overcame them. 
Robinson says that he does plan to seek office again. Meanwhile, in the Georgia gubernatorial race, Governor Nathan Deal being challenged by two candidates in the Republican primary. The Associated Press has already projected Governor Deal the winner. Here are the latest results. Governor Deal will now go up against Democratic State Senator Jason Carter, President Carter's grandson in November. Nathan Deal capturing 72% of the vote. David Pennington coming in with 17%. John Bart with 11%. Turning back now to local races, three city council races were contested in this election. Incumbent Jerry Pops Barnes, first elected to represent District 1 back in 2006. He's challenged by former Columbus mayoral candidate Zeph Baker. Take a look at the results from District 1. 66% for Pops Barnes to 34% for Zeph Baker. That's with 38% uh, of the precincts reporting. Again, we are not giving you the votes, the early votes. They have not been tabulated and passed along to us at this time. Moving now to the Council District 7 race results, incumbent Mimi Woodson, who has held that seat for 16 years. She was challenged by Xavier McCaskey, but Mimi Woodson with 63% of the vote over her opponent. And moving now to the next race for City Council District 9, that is the uh, at-large seat, uh, City uh, Judy Thomas with 63%, uh, followed by Felicia Hamilton with 37% of that vote. All right, now what's the mood like tonight as those results are coming in? News 3 Sarah Panko has been tracking the City Council races for us. She's live here in the studio with a closer look. Sarah. Teresa, Phil, I just got back from Jerry Pops Barnes campaign headquarters on Buena Vista Road. He, like all the other candidates I spoke with tonight, were grateful for their supporters and the voters. I've had the opportunity that a lot of people have not had, and I call that a blessing, and I call that winning anyway with the people that you meet and the people you encounter and some of the things that I have done that I've never dreamed I would do. I am actually doing exactly what my constituents want me to do. For me, that's the real buy-in for walking the streets every day and whatever is knowing that I'm doing exactly what they want me to do. I love representing the people of Columbus and working for them and making sure that their issues are uh, heard by the powers that be. Judy Thomas was the chief of staff to former Mayor Jim Weatherington. She won the at-large seat on council four years ago, defeating realtor Travis Chambers. The 68-year-old is now retired. Evelyn Mimi Woodson has served as District 7 counselor for 20 years. She told me tonight that she at first did not want to seek re-election, but later had a change of heart. The 56-year-old is also a supervisor at TSIS, and Jerry Pops Barnes was first elected to the position in 2006 when he defeated long-term incumbent Councilor Nathan Suber. All the candidates I spoke with tonight are ready to continue their work in their districts, and it looks like they will do so. Live in the studio, Sarah Panko, WRBL News 3 on your side. All right, thank you, Sarah. Now to the Muskogee County School Board, where there are three contested races, four district seats there. The race for the District 2 seat has three candidates challenging incumbent John Wells, who has held the seat for 28 years. Taking a look at the results, John Thomas with 36% of the vote. John Wells, the incumbent, 34%. Bart Steed with 21% of the vote. Meanwhile, in District 8 tonight, incumbent Beth Harris faced off against Frank Myers, who has been critical of some school board policies. Taking a look at those results, Myers with 69% of the vote tonight over Harris's 31%. And again, these do not count the early votes that have yet to been uh, tabulated and passed along to us. Three candidates faced off to see who would succeed Kathy Williams for the at-large school board seat. Checking the results of that race, Kia Chambers with 46%, Owen Ditchfield 37%, and Nate Sanderson with 17% of the vote. And that's with 11% of the uh, precincts reporting. Now, News 3's Naomi Kitt is on the election watch with the school board candidates tonight. She joins us now in the studio with a reaction from today's results. Naomi. Phil, Teresa, several of the candidates had watch parties at various locations around the city this evening. I got the chance to speak to a number of them tonight. Whether they won or lost, they were thankful for their supporters and have big visions for the school district. Here's what a couple of those candidates had to say. It's energized me because when you go out and you talk to people and you look them in the eye and they, they get your message and they finally believe we can have a better school system. Uh, and I think that message has resonated and, and it really is, uh, it's a heartwarming experience to, to know that, that people are beginning to believe again. Thanks for the 
people that, that decided that they wanted to support this campaign. And going forward, we're going to find a way to still serve our community. A lot of people have really stepped up, contributed to my campaign, have supported me and helped me. I really want to thank them. And most of all, I want to thank my wife because she has been very supportive and I couldn't do any of this without her. This is the way the community gets to get involved. Members earlier in the day, she watched the results at her home with her family this evening. We also visited at-large candidates Nate Sanderson and Owen Ditchfield at their election parties tonight as well. And the candidates I spoke to were thankful to supporters and ready to make a change in the school district. Live in the studio, Naomi Kitt, WRBL News 3 on your side. All right, thank you, Naomi. Two Republicans, Vivian Childs and Greg Duke, faced off in the primary to see which one will go up against incumbent Sanford Bishop in the second congressional district. Bishop is serving his 11th term in office right now, it looks like. Greg Duke with 71% and Vivian Childs with 29% of the vote at this point. Now, in the 3rd Congressional District, Congressman Lynn Westmoreland has one candidate standing between him and re-election, and that's Chip Flanagan. Taking a look at the results, it appears Lynn Westmoreland well on his way back to Congress, 70% of the vote to 30%, and that is with 72% of the precincts reporting statewide or in that particular district. Meanwhile, over to Troop County, where residents are voting on some big economic decisions concerning alcohol sales. One referendum asked voters to decide whether to allow beer and wine to be be sold on Sundays. Voters decided by 61% of the vote, yes, they would allow beer and wine to be sold on Sunday. And they also weighed in on whether to allow alcohol to be sold on Sundays. The results in Troop County, a 60 to 40% vote in favor of yes. They are uh, going ahead and giving a thumbs up to Sunday alcohol sales in Troop County. And similar measures being voted on over in Quitman County. Residents there decided that they would allow Sunday package sales in that referendum by a vote of 66% to 34%. And when it comes to allowing liquor to be sold on Sunday, they decided 69% over 31 percent. Now Quitman residents also had the option to allow restaurants to serve drinks by the glass on Sunday. They decided in favor by a vote of 67 percent to 33 percent. All right, coming up, Chief Meteorologist Bob Jeswell has a full look at your forecast, including that all-important holiday weekend. Plus, a CSU political analyst here in our studios to give us his take on tonight's results. But first, we'll leave you with a look at the results of some other races throughout the area as our campaign 2014 coverage continues. News 3 brings you your first alert forecast. Thanks for staying with us on this campaign 2014 and this special weather coverage night. Weather has been fantastic, not a factor, right? Uh, some changes we'll talk about. Well, a significant change when it comes to heat, that's for sure. And if you notice off to the east from Savannah to Jacksonville, we've been seeing a sea breeze effect coming in. And those light color shaded greens are keeping us cool in the eastern part of the state. Some of that air will probably just get close, not quite, maybe up through Macon in the overnight. But now, rather comfortable. We're in the lower 70s to upper 60s out there. Today, we managed to get up to 80 six and a low of 61. Now, if that doesn't come close to what average is, I don't know what does, right? Uh, we're just right along the average line, but we will uh, exceed this coming up in the extended forecast. No records, though. Uh, you'd have to be talking 94 degrees. We're not going to see that kind of heat, but coming close, coming close. Here's your first alert forecast in any overnight. Uh, clear and mild. We're going about 63 degrees. The winds are light. Now, this morning was 61, so you'll see that the, pretty much the same story when you wake up. We'll have the sunshine, mostly sunny to those fair weather clouds dotting the sky in the afternoon, but enough heat of the day to get these temperatures up. Now, high pressure is kind of anchored in here. Air quality is becoming a little bit more, um, let's say, not so good when it comes to mixing the air, when it comes to particulate matter. So that's because the air mass is calm. It's not moving. It's not mixing too well. We'll get up to about 82 uh, mild degrees here at midday and about 89 at 5 p.m. This still isn't the warmest day that we're forecasting of the year. It's coming up now in your first alert three-day forecast. Check this out by Thursday and Friday, 92 degrees. Now, this is the warmest day so far this year, and we've been doing pretty good. 
on average, typically May, over 30 years, if you average it out, you typically hit 90 by May 10th. And here we are talking about the 21st, and 90s are finally coming with overnight lows in the upper 60s, so mild overnight temperatures. By Saturday and Sunday, looking real good. Hey, Callaway Gardens, you want to see the best water skiers in the world? They're coming up this weekend at Robin Lake. You don't want to miss that at Robin uh, Beach. Robin Lake Beach, and that's at Callaway Gardens Saturday and Sunday with those temperatures in the lower 90s. Perfect. Now, the only factor is this, is high pressure builds over Bermuda and probably heard this before Bermuda high. It swings in a little bit more humidity and moisture to trigger off a slight or stray shower or storm. Now what's else is coming up on Memorial Day. Let's talk about this weekend forecast. You saw the little red, white and blue here. Team red, white and blue. They designate all over gyms across the United States. It's a nonprofit organization for veterans and veterans families. Uh, help support a veteran and get a free workout and, and maybe make a donation too. We'd ask you for that as well. Don an uncommon athlete. Get there about seven 45 in the morning Saturday, kicking the workout out for one hour starting at 8. A great weekend for that to give back to a veteran and thank them for what they've done. A great weekend in store with those temperatures holding about 90. Phil and Teresa. All right, thanks a lot, Bob. When we return, we're breaking down tonight's election results and what they mean for you. We will have CSU's Dr. Nick Easton here in the studio to tell us what implications this year's hot races carry as our campaign 2014 coverage continues. We're going to take a break from numbers now to break down some of the race results through the eyes of a political analyst. And of course, joining us once again, the perspective from the CSU political science professor, Dr. Nicholas Easton. We appreciate you being with us once again, uh, Dr. Nick, as we'll Thank call you. you. Uh, any surprises that you uh, that, that strike you from looking at the results that we've reported so far? I think the biggest surprise was there was no surprises. I mean, it, it was pretty predictable. Um, I looked at a couple of things that I mentioned on the 6 o'clock broadcast, a couple of things to look for, and they didn't seem to pan out. One of the big questions locally was whether or not this change in the election calendar to the judge's ruling a few months ago would, would put a funny pairing by having primaries on the same day as our nonpartisan local elections, and would that have an effect? It doesn't look like it did. So that was no surprise, and I think we were pretty accurate on guessing who would be the winners in the uh, uh, Senate, the Republican Senate primary, mm -hmm. and it looks like it's going to be uh, uh, Purdue mm -hmm. and then either Kingston or Handel. Um, and it, it looks like Kingston, but Handel still has a chance. It's, there's still a lot of vote out there. So um, uh, that means uh, it's pretty predictable, pretty much <laughs> what we expected. <laughs> well, you mentioned that U.S. Senate race. No, no, uh, no surprise there about Michelle Nunn. I think it was just a question of by how much of a margin she would win that Democratic nomination. Let's talk about money. She's raised a lot of it. But the Republicans, if they want to hold on to that seat, they've got to spend some money before November because they've got another election. Yes, exactly. They've got to spend some money um, in this runoff. And more importantly in the runoff, they've got to be careful not to box themselves. Um, remember that the, the Tea Party candidates, if you will, the extreme candidates, were the losers in today's primary. That's, that's been a trend we've seen across the country where Tea Partiers are beginning to fall out of favor, theoretically. We can talk about that some other day. Okay. But what that means is that the, the winners uh, that are vying for that final spot are going to have to appeal to that vote, and that may force them more to the, uh, to the uh, extremes and make it a little uh, easier for Michelle Nunn. But it's going to be a close race regardless. Okay. All right, Dr. Nicholas Easton, thank you so much for thank your time. You. Now we have some breaking news to report from Phoenix City tonight. Phoenix City Council has voted to fire City Manager Wallace Hunter effective immediately. Mayor Eddie Lowe told us that the vote happened at the end of tonight's regular City Council meeting. Lowe says that he cast one of the two votes in support of Hunter, who has been with the city and as City Manager since 2008. Well, tournament baseball all over the place tonight. Sports director Jonathan Husky joining us now. Busy night, huh? Yeah, it sure was. We had Alabama, Georgia, and Georgia Tech all in action here tonight. One team advanced to move on. One's going home, and, and we don't know about the third one yet. I've got highlights and updates from everywhere. Next, in three on your side sports. Time for News 3 Sports. 
This is three on your side sports. I'm Jonathan Husky. The Alabama Crimson Tide had somewhat stumbled to the finish line of the regular season. Still in good position to make the NCAA tournament field though, but wanted a strong showing in the SEC tournament. Tide essentially playing a home game against Kentucky today in the Hoover Met. Bottom third tied down 2 nothing. Wade Wass drills this one to left. That's in the gap. And that one hops the wall. Georgie Salem comes all the way around from first to score. And that makes it a two to one ball game. But then we have some issues in the fourth. Austin Cousineau pops one into shallow right in the Bermuda Triangle out there. That drops for a hit, a run scores. But then Alabama throws to second for some reason. Storm Wilson scores all the way from first. That makes it four to one. And that one was all the Tide could get. They are one and done, seven to one, awaiting now their region and seating. Our team's in danger of both going one and done. Georgia trailing Mississippi State 4 to 2 right now in the top of the 7th. Dogs led 2 to 1 going into the inning, but after starter Dylan Cole was removed, State took the lead on the next batter. To the ACC tournament, 9 seed Georgia Tech taking on Wake Forest this afternoon. Jackets just needed one big inning and they got it in the second. Mitch Ernest, that rattles around into the corner with two on. Let's Ryan Purifoy score from second. Ernest got a double. It's one nothing. Next batter, Daniel Spingola. That one's headed to deep right, and that one's off the wall. Ernest would score. Brandon Gold would come in to score. That makes it a 3 to nothing ball game. Spingola has a triple. Next batter, the best name in the game, Mott Hyde. That's drilled off the wall. A run scores. That's another triple, and it's 5 nothing. We move now to the ninth. It's 5-3. to three. Sinking liner into left. And look at Matt Gonzalez coming in and laying out for the grab. What a play for the second out. He wasn't done with two outs. Fly ball into the corner. And Gonzalez makes a great run and grab. Tech wins this one 5-3. to three. They'll face top seed Miami tomorrow at 3. It's a big win for them. Alabama easily into the NCAA tournament field. But uh, Georgia Tech right there on the bubble. So win tonight. Strong showing against Miami tomorrow. They could be playing uh, well into June. Exciting highlights tonight. Uh, I do what I can. We'll be right back. Good time for a great deal during the Toyota Time Sales event. Hurry in and save on an amazing selection of your favorite Toyotas. Now get 0% APR for 36 months on a new 2014 Toyota RAV4. Toyota, let's go places. Shop the Sleep Center for the best prices on brand name bedding in stock and ready for immediate delivery. At the Sleep Center, you'll find the absolute best prices on brand name bedding. Choose from Simmons, Sealy, Serta, Scandinavian, Stearns & Foster, and Tempur-Pedic bedding. Save up to $300 on Tempur-Pedics. Up to $500 off on Sealy Optimum Sleep Sets. Buy a Beautyrest or Comfort-Pedic mattress, get the box spring free. Up to $400 off Beautyrest adjustables. Serta Queen adjustables, $12.99. The Sleep Center, the mattress experts. And now, another episode of Talkin' Green with Sun South. You know, with John Deere tractors and mower, you can get the job done faster so there's more time for golf. Yep, this is the life. You're not wrong. Well, boys, now that I'm done with your work, we can leave early for my parents' house. Who's ready for a game of Scrabble? Oh, good grief. For the full line of John Deere products, visit SunSouth John Deere and let's talk green. Who chose these pants anyway? With all or nothing, you win by matching all or none of the numbers. It's a win-win, like getting a new dog who's also house trained. Play and win up to $250,000 four times a day. With all or nothing, you win by matching none or all of the numbers. It's a lose win, like getting a black eye while out with the boys after work. And earning the acceptance of your raccoon family. Play and win up to $250,000 four times a day. It's a good time for a great deal during the Toyota Time Sales event. Hurry in and save on an amazing selection of your favorite Toyotas. Now get 0% APR for 36 months on a new 2014 Toyota RAV4. Toyota, let's go places. Jeopardy! Weeknights at 7, 6 Central on WRVL. Now for a recap of tonight's top political races. Teresa Tomlinson will keep her title as Columbus's mayor for the next four years. She handily defeated challenger Colin Martin, becoming the first mayor since Bobby Peters to serve two terms in office. Take a look at those numbers. 59% for Mayor Teresa Tomlinson, Colin Martin with 41% of, of the vote.
And then a U.S. Senate race on the Republican ticket, the Associated Press, has projected that David Perdue has sewn up one of the runoff spots. But it's too close to call whether he will face off against Congressman Jack Kingston or former Secretary of State Karen Handel. Looking at those numbers there, Perdue with 30 percent, he's in, and Kingston with 26, Handel with 22 percent. As for the Democrats, that race was called early on tonight. The Associated Press projected Michelle Nunn the winner. Here's a final look at Nunn's commanding lead. 75% of the vote over Steen Miles with 12%. Todd Robinson with 10%. Let's take a look at Bronco Rod Lovachki on that next, there we go, 3% of the vote. Remember, you can find a full list of race results at the bottom of your screen and also on our website at WRBL.com. We'll be right back. Now we want to thank you for tuning in to our special coverage of the Georgia primaries campaign 2014. Just a reminder, all the results for both local and state races can be found on our website at WRBL.com. Good night, everyone, and sleep well.